What goes around just comes around. 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 What is up, folks? Welcome to Epileptic Gaming. It is week 140, and you know what? Even though it's Wednesday, it kind of feels like Friday because it's the last day we're doing the show, and we got a special guest in the studio. So it's uh, I- I'm liking today. I didn't, didn't you know didn't do much work. I played a lot of games. I don't know Suma, uh, who's on the board by the way. You, st- you stream and stick a moderation. Uh, you what did you do today other than pick up your mom's? Who's I, in the peanut gallery by the way? Yeah, my mom's here. I uh, I sold that piece of crap that is uh, Resident Evil Umbrella Chronicles. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, thank and God I, GameStop gave me twenty dollars for it. I, and I, I can't <laughs> believe that, dude. I can't I, believe that. Yeah, and I picked up Mass Effect. Uh, I talked to Marcus this morning. I talked to Wheat this morning about it. I was a little hesitant. I wasn't on the uh, bandwagon like everyone else, but you know what? We we convinced me. I, I I wanted to know if the story was good, if the voice acting was good. He said yes and yes and. I, I'm now officially going to be on the Mass Effect bandwagon. Yeah. The, the funny thing, Suma, is that I didn't tell you any of the problems that the game has, so you'll be finding out some of that. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. <laughs> Over on production, we have got camera. What's up, buddy? What's up, y'all? What's going on, man? Not right, much. You've, you've got probably uh, a full weekend, like four or five days full of just what? Playing Lots nothing of soccer. but 10 Oh. <laughs> No, um, no, no Tenchu Z for me, but yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend Thanksgiving in Long Beach, and then uh, I think I'm gonna, you know, just hang out and play some video games like the rest of us. I like your gram- right. grandpa shirt, Hogan. Thank you. Good job, buddy. Grandpa. Shit. I'm, feel- I'm feeling, uh, He looks like someone's like me. grandpa. What yeah. are you talking I'm about? actually going on a cruise in the Caribbean, um, with my grandparents. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I you wish you would have invited me. But uh, we've also got our special guest in the studio, Jason Rubin, co-founder of Naughty Dog and a critically acclaimed game designer and into Hello, all everybody. sorts of stuff, actually, yeah. now. I'm glad uh, after 140 shows you finally got to me now. Yeah, well, well you know, uh, sorry. We, yeah. <laughs> actually, high on the priority list, a lot of fans uh, requesting to have you on the show. Very cool. Uh, well, so Fat Baby, hopefully answer their questions. Yeah, I get, to, I get to check one off, so... Uh, Jason, uh, you have made uh, many, many games in your time. I've got a list right here of uh, you know some of the biggest that you've been credited on, of course, including the Crash Bandicoot series, a lot of the games in there, and Jack as well. But tell us a little bit about your game career. Maybe not everyone who watches the show knows who you are, but probably right. has played a game that, that you've been involved with. Quite possibly. Uh, I started in uh, 1983 on a computer. In 1985, I published my first game with Andy Gavin. He's my partner. Partner. Still my partner, still working with him. It's been, what, now 20-some-odd years. Nice. Uh, we did a lot of really bad games on the <laughs> Apple II. Very small. We were in junior high school. High school came. We did some bigger games. We signed with EA. We actually did a couple products for them. Uh, Keep the Thief, Rings of Power. Right. Rings of Power was our first console game. That was 1991. I'm aging myself here. And that came out on? Uh, Genesis. Oh, okay. Genesis. Okay. And then uh, a couple more years passed. We did a few more games. We did a 3DO game. We actually left the gaming industry, came back to do a 3DO game called Way of the Warrior. Yep. Uh, all of these games were just Andy and I up to that part. So it, you can tell what the gaming industry has gone through when my last project was done with 75, 80 people. And up until that point, we had only used two. <laughs> um, after Way of the Warrior, we signed a deal with Universal Studios. We right. moved out to California, and we started working on taking a character platform gamer into, th- in, into 3D. We settled on the PlayStation along the development path and ended up creating Crash Bandicoot, which uh, I think to date, three of the top five titles, uh, or at least three of the top ten titles, were Crash Bandicoot titles in the United States. Right, Crash right. 3 was uh, the most successful foreign-created title in the history of Japan to date. Over a million and a half copies sold. In Japan, uh, up there with Donkey Kong Country, which is a Japanese character, but what created right. elsewhere. Um, we did Jack and Daxter. Uh, ended up selling the company to Sony while doing Jack and Daxter. We did three titles for them. Uh, the fourth title, which was Jack X, some of you guys may have played. I actually didn't work on, but that was my team. Uh, I had left Naughty Dog, and re- most recently they put out Uncharted. So right. Those, right. Are, those are my guys. And since then, I've done a, a comic book, Iron and the Maiden, that's on the shelf. 
Flector.com, F-L-E-K-T-O-R.com is an internet site that what I did with Flector. my partner. What is Flector.com? I've, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. I've heard yeah. of that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, one of the reasons that I wanted to take a little time off from the game industry is when you're a game maker, all you do is sit and make games. So for yeah. 10 years since we had started on Crash Bandicoot, no vacations really, heads down making games. I kind of wanted to see what the rest of the world was about. So kind of got interested in casual gaming. I've talked to the Oberon Games guys a lot, did a little with them, uh, did a comic book, wanted to do some writing. Uh, working on some other projects, and also got really addicted to social networking a few years ago. <laughs> and I have a friend that like so many of us. Yes, yes, right, exactly. As soon as I had time to use a computer for other things besides buy things on <laughs> like Amazon, hot, right? exactly. Yeah, right, well, right. Of course, as soon as computers were created, <laughs> there was time for that girl is hot. But spent a little time on MySpace and kind of got excited by it. Uh, have a friend that was head of marketing for MySpace and. Uh, said to her, you guys really need to do something to allow people to present themselves better, you know, take their pictures, take their videos, mash them together, make them interesting. She said, we have so much to do at MySpace and so many plans, we don't have time. So I said, great, we'll, I'll do it on the side and we'll sell it to you. And she said, yeah, you go for it there, nice. buddy. And so we did. <laughs> and uh, Flector is now owned by Fox Interactive, which owns MySpace. So uh, it's a media mashup tool. Go look at it. It's fun. It has nothing to do with gaming. And All can right, you tell cool. us a little nice. bit about Iron and the Maiden, the, the comic book? I'm sure there's some uh, viewers out there. Definitely comic book got some comic fans on the show. Yeah, well, you know, one, the, another thing about making Thank games you. is that if you're successful at making a game, you tend to make a sequel. This is, this is a, a yeah, limited edition cover of the of the uh, first Iron Book that came out. That's hot, dude. You see that girl edition? there? Yeah, that I've, been, I've been holding that. Right we, I've, I've been having a unit that we have, have this a Michael Turner and uh, Francis Manipal special cover there, two artists. Yeah. Where it's signed on eBay, you'd actually be able to get some money for that's, it. Uh, that's been, that's we been, been sitting in my... We can probably get that. Well, my signature's worth nothing, it turns out. The first books that went out signed, if the artist signed it, it like quadrupled the value. If I signed it, it was a few dollars less. So apparently I ruined the value. That, of the, of that the thing's comics. been sitting in my apartment for the past couple months, and uh, thank God you're on here to sign it and maybe give it away. That's yeah, right. absolutely. <laughs> well, Iron was an idea that I had had a long, long time ago. When you, Like I said, if you're successful in games, you end up making a lot more than one title. Yeah. So you have all these ideas, but you're doing Crash 6, Crash 8, Crash 20, <laughs> Crash 30, Jack 3, and, and so right. there were plenty of ideas in my head that had never made it to the games. It takes a lot to make a game. It doesn't take as much to make a comic, though I was surprised after going through the entire production cycle, how much it really does take to make a comic series. So I hired a bunch of artists, put it on paper, uh, and it, it, the last issue's on the stands right now, the fourth issue. I gotta, I, I gotta ask, you know, you, you went through a very, very long period of time with much success in gaming, and I'm sure you saw your, your fair share of, you know, cloudy days and, and, yeah, sure. and hurdles to overcome. But was it there something more um, empowering that like made you want to leave gaming? Was there was there problems that you saw? Was that you know like, or no, was it just sort of getting burnt out on? I, it? I got a little bit burnt out, and and I, and like I said, I wanted to look at the world from a thousand feet instead of being heads down in right, gaming. You know, right. I had my or that's all that matters. I had my opinions, and they're they're very well known about the developer publisher relationship at the time, but. Until you step out of your situation, you can't really look at the world as a greater as a greater whole and see you know what's really going on. So I wanted to take that time and kind of step back and look at the world, and it's it's been really beneficial. Like I said, I created and sold an internet company since then. So right. you know I've I've definitely found that there's there's life after gaming. And, and that's Having actually... said that, I have the game bug in me. There's no question that. I'm constantly thinking about game ideas, things to do with games. I watch games. Good stuff comes out. You know, Uncharted's coming out. Awesome game on the shelf. Incredible reviews. My guys that I work with, right, so talented. Right. You can see it wasn't me. It was the talent, obviously. It was the, <laughs> that it was at Naughty Dog that made the games good because Uncharted's amazing. I miss it. I wish I had been there. You know, more power to them and congratulations definitely to all the Naughty Dog guys yeah. if you happen to be watching. You did it again. I don't know how many in a row this is, but it has to be a record of it's, titles. It, that are I mean, it's it's definitely and awesome. Um, and you say you've got that gaming bug. So if anyone, well, that's my has life. I'm a gamer. You know, I, I I've gone on a lot of meetings. I happen to live in Los Angeles. I have friends that are directors and the like. So I've gone to a lot of meetings, obviously in comic books and other things. And I will always be the game guy in right. another realm. Right. No uh, matter that's how long I did something else. I understand else. that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you like that role? I mean, do absolutely. You like Absolutely. When yeah. I started in games, 
there was no love for games. And remember, right. the game industry collapsed yeah. when Nintendo collapsed. So the game industry in the old days was very tenuous. You didn't know how long it was going to be around. There was You're certainly right. no respect for it. My parents always thought I was going to get a real job at some point. <laughs> and now the game industry is a 100% equal entertainment industry to everybody else. It's got, you know, maybe the biggest entertainment launch in a 24-hour period is probably uh, Halo 3. Right. You have massive amounts of sales of the games. It's leaking into television. It's leaking into movies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, game ideas are moving beyond games mm -hmm. uh, in a larger fashion, and, and not only a back-to-the-bank situation, but people are actually, right. you know, interested in seeing movies uh, made out of game material. So the game industry is now a full-fledged entertainment industry, industry and there's nothing i have to feel shy about and jason right. 10 and years ago in hollywood i felt shy being a game guy now it's great it's right like i conquered it's the gaming. new hotness and yeah. and you know i've been thinking about it a lot and and you're seeing more of this with games like halo and if you've played call of duty 4 recently or heavenly sword you're seeing more hollywood infusion you're seeing the music industry oh, infusion with guitar hero absolutely Do you feel that the video game industry maybe could be the dominant media entertainment form in maybe like 10 to 20 years from now i mean the music industry has to look at something like Guitar Hero and see that as their future for making money, that the interactivity. Music, they absolutely, they have to. And I'm just throwing it out here, the music industry has to be using the video game industry at this point as some sort of crutch. It really is a way for new artists to get out. And I mean, it seems like an essential piece to the whole thing. What right. are your thoughts? Well, I, I would never be the guy to stand up and say that any industry is going to take over because you can't predict the future. Yeah, and, you and, really and can't. Like, gaming has a bunch of things going for it. First of all, I think long term we can protect ourselves from piracy. So if you pirate out there, you're you're hurting the industry, and eventually, uh, because it's nonlinear and it's not, it, it will eventually be delivered digitally and the like. I think right. that will help the game industry. Absolutely, it'll hurt the piracy industry. It's it's too bad for pirates, but it'll Peace. be good for us long term. Arr. Um, Arr, and I think that that's opinion. very important because when you make a movie. More and more, it's going to be like the music industry where you get a very quick window on the theater and right. maybe some DVD sales, but as soon as it's out, uh, the piracy is going to run rampant. And, right. and, you know, the music industry has live concerts. What does the movie industry have besides the big screen? And as screens get bigger and bigger, it's comfortable watching them at home. So I think right. the game industry, you know, even if you're a pirate and you love the fact that you get your games for free, I think long term, as a game lover, you should hope that the game industry is the one that doesn't have piracy and moves forward. And interactivity, Absolutely. we're the only interactive medium in the entertainment medium. Well, and I think that's an extremely powerful thing. In, in that vein, do you think that maybe the reason why people are pirating is because they're too expensive? Like, how do you feel about current game pricing then? Right. Well, you know, this is a really good question, and it's, it's, it's impossible to answer. All I will say is, and I... I know $69 or $59 is a huge amount of money to pay. I have a friend that's going out and buying the entire Rockstar package yeah. today, and that's, you know, 170 bucks. And that's, I don't care who you are, that's real money, right? You that's, have to think about that's that. That's an investment right there, Having folks. said that, the return on that investment as, as a game player, I think, is greater than you get from any other medium in terms of the hours you play. Think that's of how point. many hours you get out of that. Um, it, it's, it's one of those vicious cycles, right? When I made Crash Bandicoot, I made it for under $2 million. When I did Jack 3, it was $15 million. Uncharted is a significantly more expensive title. There's a lot more in there. The price has gone up $10 since we released Crash on the shelf, and yet the price of the game to make it has gone up 10 times, right, 15 times. Right. So the gamer is actually getting a lot more development in that box. Marketing mm -hmm. is more expensive too. I would never argue that you're getting your value out of the marketing because that's getting you into the store. But in terms of the actual number of people working on that title, the time it takes to make the title, the energy that goes into making it, it's $10 more than it was when we did Crash and you're getting a hell of a lot better a game. And there's been inflation. I mean, honestly, it's of a course, cheaper right. game today than it was back then. Huh. I wish games didn't cost that much to make, then we could sell it for less. But the truth of the matter is, takes time. they're costing 20, 30, yeah. some of these games. But 40 there is variation happening in the market with, with PlayStation Network, Xbox Live Marketplace, the rise of casual games on the PC. Renting there games. still is room there, though, for you know, up and coming developers mm -hmm. to get noticed, such as Everyday Shooter was made by one guy, right? Yeah. So there is still room for the for the lowly guy or the the lowly group to get noticed. No get question. And the there, best right? thing that's happened to the game industry is the diversity of games that's coming out now. You yeah. know, if you look at the average gamer that's playing on Oberon.com sites like Pogo and and MySpace Games, 
the average is actually a woman in her 50s. Yeah, yeah. So that was an audience that I never thought would be a big game player. But they're spending huge amounts of dollars, huge amounts of time playing games. And that's a buffer for the industry. So if the casual market is strong and, for example, the high-end market has a weak year, it's not going to kill the publishers because they have that diversity. Right, And I think right. that's a really good thing that's happened to the game industry. And again, it gives you the ability to express yourself in a much broader medium. It's not all first-person shooters. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely Guitar right. Hero is a perfect example of what the game industry should be doing in terms of giving itself uh, new, new places to reach into you know, the audience and, and new people to play. There are people that play ga- Guitar Hero that I never thought would play a video game. And they love uh, you're it. You're right. You're right. And they they can't get enough of it. And that's you know why it sells. Yeah. Like and as much as as much as we hate on the Wii and, and casual it's games, I love. I actually really love them because they're just making the industry grow even more. And yeah. without them, we'd be stuck in this little niche nerd market. Oh, the, the more the, casual people that play, I'm all for it. Crash had yeah. two buttons: jump and spin. And people, <laughs> there were people I remember that had a hard time playing it. And by the time we made wow. Jack. By the time we made Jack 3, we had charts on the wall explaining how the controller worked in different ways right. during different modes. Well, in flight mode, this button now does this. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It just got way beyond what people could handle. So I think the Wii success is going effectively not only back to two buttons, but going to point at it. Right. You know, as, as much as you might not like that as a hardcore gamer, there are a lot of people out there that don't have, like I have, you have years in the industry... I- to know how to use these controllers. I totally agree, and actually that does bring up something that I wanted to talk with you about, and that is the concept and something that we talk about on the show a lot with our callers. By the way, callers, let's go ahead and open up the phone lines. They're open. After, okay, so after we do this uh, question, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a caller question, but one of the things that we talk about a lot is that it seems to us is that there is a almost a split in the market, and that games need to be to focus to be made for almost three different types of market. This new we shoot at it, I'm six and I'm having a load of fun and it's an educational learning tool. You've got this middle market that's games for everyone. I sort of equate it to PG-13 movies. And then you've got like the R market, which is, you know, guys like us who have been around forever that, you know, is looking for maybe that next mature, you know, push in games or something catered more towards us. Do you feel like the game companies are are having a problem like going to these various markets because with Manhunt 2 and the whole AO thing? I mean, it seems ridiculous to me that like as a gamer who has been playing for 25 years, I can't get ultimately what I want, which maybe is a little bit more violent or maybe, you know, a little bit more mature themed games. Yeah, I, I you know, I don't know that I'd agree that the hardcore gamer can't get his fill or her fill of hardcore games. I think there are a decent number out there. I think what you're seeing is when you go to the shelf, less of the shelf is focused at you as a hard, hard, hardcore yeah, gamer. Yeah, well, you're right. But the shelf yeah. is a lot wider. It is. And there's a bigger yes. variety. Yes. So it's it's like the movie industry. Movies don't get made along the lines. Someone walks in and pitches, I'm going to make a movie for everybody. No movie is for everybody. Right. They pitch it at a specific audience or two, and then they hope that they can pick up people from another audience. And because of that, the movie industry serves everything from two-year-olds, five-year-olds, and ten-year-olds to hardcore action fans. And on the other end, you know, you got your Walter Lemon and, and Mathal movie right, type things. Right. I know they're not doing them anymore, but that kind of movie that's made for 50-year-olds. And that, that breadth, again, is healthy for the industry. And as the game industry broadens, I think it's going to be healthier. You may not be able to walk into a store and see 50 titles all geared to you, but you may see 300 titles of which 30 of them are geared to you. Well, on top of that, then, how do you feel about the fact that, you know, Manhunt was basically, sorry, caller, one second, that Manhunt was basic, Manhunt 2 specifically, um, even though I really thought it was terrible, it, it, it seemed butchered, almost like uh, sort of outlawed in the fact that they were an adult-only title because a, a lot in part of the we and the fact that we are seeing an, uh, just an insurge, I think, of younger gamers really just flock to the market. And, got, and like you said, my wife, who... Well, what do you mean by slaughtered? I mean, it came out, right? It came out mature. Well, it, it was censored. Okay, go back to when I was a kid and Slaughterhouse, the video game, came out. I remember I mean, playing that Slaughterhouse. Was, ooh, that was hardcore. Right. And literally, it was a guy with a sword that and hacked people. it wasn't people. even that. So there right. was, that was it. There was right. nothing at all violent or adults only in the market. So I think the market is allowing things that are more violent uh, than ever before. 
And granted, some of them are going to get panned and some of them are going to get trouble, but okay. it did see the shelf. Okay. And it, it right. may not have seen the shelf 10 years ago. And I don't think that anybody is saying, because there are Wii gamers, these games shouldn't come out. And by the way, in every other industry, the same thing happens. You're, there I, are albums that come out that the rap is just a little too strong, and they get crap, and they come out, but they're, no one will market them or whatever. Movies that are AO get cut to BR. Movies that are R get yeah. cut to be PG-13. This, this happens all over the world. And it, you know, if somebody wants to create an incredibly violent video game and put it out, there is a format out there that will allow them to do it. It's the PC, and nobody will stop them unless they're doing something that is against laws, like under you know, underage sex or something right. like that. I mean, yeah, fair enough. Within the law, they can put out any game they want. If a if a publisher or a or a hardware says this is not what we want, I don't think that's killing the market. I think that's totally fair because okay. there is there okay. is a market where you can do anything you want, and that's the PC. All right, so we'll come Good back point. to that in yeah. just a second too. That's uh, it's a really great point right there. A caller. Caller, what's up? Uh, you have a do you have a question? What's up? Yeah, I got a question for the uh, developer there. Dude, you came up with so many great games. I mean, where do you get these ideas from? Do you dream of them or something? <laughs> Did you dream of them? Uh, sometimes, actually. Uh, you know, when you really get into a game, you definitely have ideas in the weirdest of places. I will not mention specifically which, but you can imagine. The bathroom. <laughs> uh, I, I, I honestly don't know how. I do have a lot of ideas. I remember vividly watching Star Wars at seven years old and at the same time playing Dungeons and Dragons and realizing at that time that that's what I wanted to do with my life, is I wanted to create worlds. And from that point on, my focus was on creating worlds. That's just, that's just what excites me. That's just what it is. And I, where does it come from? I honestly don't know. Um, I, and there are other people that aren't good at creating, but they're better at actually taking creations and doing it. I can't draw. I have no ability to draw. I can come up with ideas, but I can't actually make it paper in any way so someone else can see Sounds it. Sounds like so, me. There are people that are amazing at taking ideas and then making them visually cool. Joe Mad, by the way, one of the, the guys who designed Iron and, and Angel, the reason I went to him to design the, the, the heroes to Iron and the Maiden is because he can literally take anything and say, I, I want a pickle in gym shorts and I want him to be badass. And, <laughs> and he will draw is. that pickle and you will know that it's the <laughs> baddest ass pickle on the planet. So that's not my talent. So did you come just, up with I Crash? Uh, did you specifically come up with Crash? I led the team that came up with Crash. Just like in movies, there's a collaborative effort right. among a lot of people. There were eight people at Naughty Dog at the time. Uh, Bob Raffi uh, definitely was the guy with paper at Naughty Dog. We had Charles Zembelis and Joe Pearson, two Hollywood uh, cartoon creators uh, that we kind of contracted oh, wow. with that came in. Um, I led the process. I was the director that kind of moved it along, but there were incredibly, you know, Creative people working on that. No Andy, idea is one person. Is by the Andy, way. Uh, your you know longtime partner, yeah. is he often a source for inf inspiration and ideas? I he think? is. Well, some of the early games we did, Rings of Power specifically, was his game. I mean, I, I was the artist on it, but I none of that was was my idea. Andy's very much more uh, fantasy. Uh, World of Warcraft is the game he always wanted to make. He's right. got like. 50 level 70 or whatever characters at this point. It's like, that's the game he always wanted to make. And there was a time in the market where that kind of game wasn't doing well. And Andy just didn't design because that's all he wanted to design. And then we were working hard on Jack. And he's like, God, we got to make this, this Dungeons and Dragons in 3D multiplayer oh, wow. game. It would do oh, so wow. well. And I'm like, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. And then, yeah. you know, Blizzard Ooh. comes out and like, yeah, Jason, just puts you the smackdown on, on that. What do you I, think about that? Well, because, you know, you mentioned PC games too. And of course, you, you, get, you can find about a thousand forum threads about guys like World of Warcraft's killing the PC and blah, blah, blah. I no. Mean, how can you say that? World of Warcraft is killing the PC. World of Warcraft is entertaining millions of people. I know. How can that kill the PC? In that market, people don't switch back and forth between games yeah. as readily. You have your subscription. You don't want your characters to die. You certainly don't want to start over as a level zero. Go knock around a couple squirrels or whatever right. it is to get your experience. I'm into that. Um, I think that game industry will also mature and people will start to spread out. It won't all be World of Warcraft all the time. Right. Um, someone else will come out with something compelling and challenging. And, and fantasy is not the only thing in the world that people want to play. Right, you know? exactly. How about World of Future? Right? <laughs> someone come out with something different. Uh, caller, we got a new caller on the uh, on the horn. Caller, you got a question for Jason? Yeah, um, I just want to thank you for creating uh, Crash Bandicoot because that game was freaking awesome. Which I welcome. loved it. Crash. Oh, Crash. 
Yeah. After Super Mario World, that I was just like totally into. It was a pretty awesome game. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know that I will ever outdo what we did with Crash. I hope to be on a project um, like Crash again. Crash One. It's great. It was a good game, but it wasn't. I think Crash Two and Crash Three really were the ones where we got the gameplay right and and, and everything kind of came together. Those, did, those games were well, a lot of fun. Did you have a question, caller? Did you have a question, caller? Yeah. Um, wait. You got to clear your list on the PSN. It's full. You can't play with <laughs> you. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What he, was is that a question? Is that a needed, statement? He said that I needed <laughs> have, to clear my PSN list because of his fault. Oh. All right, we have right some housekeeping issues. Show. Thanks. <laughs> Never that mind so that important. Jason Rubin's in studio. Yeah, yeah. We have PSN. Clear it. Is That's small, my okay? answer. <laughs> Jason says, "Get rid of it all. Wipe we'll it hold. off." All right. Well, uh, well, let's take a let's take another uh, another caller. Um, and, and while we're doing, call, we got Jobber, you're on the air. Thank you. Hey, what's going on, guys? Yo. All right, what I want to ask you, Mr. Rubin, is mm -hmm. what do you consider the most important feature in a video game? Like, do you consider gameplay is the main thing to focus on or storyline should be the most important thing or sound design? Like, what? Well, it's gameplay, but uh, gameplay is, is very hard to define without talking about how good the sound is these days. If the sound's absolutely terrible, it won't play well. I mean, sound tells you when your feet hit the ground if you're jumping. Sound tells you when you've gotten something right or wrong in Guitar Hero. So sound design is, in Guitar Hero is the gameplay to a certain extent. Uh, but it's an interactive media. At the end of the day, the only reason people pick games up is to enjoy themselves interactively. If all you are is a story, I don't think that makes a good video game. It may make a great movie uh, or book, but it doesn't make a great video game. So yes, it is gameplay. And, and again, it's very hard to define exactly what gameplay is. It's different in different games. Yeah, I, uh, he's peace, so. That's a, it's he a does great thank answer. you for answering that, so. No problem. Um, we do have another caller if you guys right, really sure, want to keep fire it rolling. Out. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, Hello, Head Jobber. Not much. Hey. I, I have two questions for Jason. Hold, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Fat, Fat Baby, this is actually Fat Baby. He's like one of the show's number one fans, and he is just in love with you. So yeah, he's... He has been messaging <laughs> me for the past week going, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So go uh, ahead. These are going to be good questions that I'm okay, going to set up. Okay. The, well, the first question is, um, how different is it from creating a video game to a comic book? Okay. Oh. And the second question is, uh, I'll, I'll give you both questions. Um, and no the problem. second question is, um, how does it feel to be the character model for Nathan Drake? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer in reverse order. I am not the character model that for is fucking the awesome. I, I want to be very clear. I was not even Bullshit, in, I was not are. even in the building when the character Pull was designed. Out, it's just like epiphany. Oh it's, my god. It is 100% Evan Wells. Get him on the show and I promise <laughs> okay. you it is him. He's the director now at Naughty Dog. He's he's running the show there. It is him. You bear resemblance to him then? I, I, he's your twin brother? I have Dark hair and wear jeans. I guess that's where, oh, the, where the connection uh, ends. But it, so I'll be playing myself, I guess, is what you're saying when I, when I pick it up. Um, and, and what was the first question? I've now forgotten it. I'm sorry. What's it like to go from creating a video oh, yeah, game yeah, to yeah. a comic book? Absolutely. Uh, similar and different. Creating worlds is creating worlds. I fundamentally believe that. If you can create a good game world, you can probably create a good story for a movie. You know, a good world is a good world. Having said that... Um, Working in a comic book these days is still a very hands-on, very old-school uh, system. I mean, I would talk to the artist, the penciler, Francis Manipal or Joel Gomez, depending on whether it was foreground or background. He would take up his pencil. He would draw. When he was done with his drawing, he would put it in FedEx and send it to the other penciler, who would then... I mean, everything was done like it would have been done 30 years ago. There's no technology at all going on in comic books. So, and it was a small That's team, awesome. so it felt a lot like making Crash Bandicoot, which was an eight-person team, because we more or less had eight people working on the comic book. Uh, it's, it's very slow because of the fact that it's one person drawing. So it's, it's different in that sense. Huh. Um, whereas games are 80 people now working on technology, everything's right cutting edge, you know, cutting edge, you ask for something, hopefully you get it back quickly, it's, it's, right. it's a very different world, a lot more pressure, a lot more stress, a lot more coming at you, um, but, but you know, overall creating worlds is creating worlds. I enjoyed both of them, I, you know, I, I, neither one would I say was better. 
And there, there, there he is uh, behind All us right. right now. There, there's oh, yeah, Jason there right there. <laughs> so, there's a pretty good resemblance, but we'll have to What kind of, what kind of gun do you normally I roll with there? I don't think so. Here, let's see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, so Jason, awesome. you're... Actually, that is my... Sh- no, I'm just... <laughs> Jason, you're pretty out... Or at least you were in 2004, at least very outspoken guy. about the industry. Um, what are some of the things that you see, you know are really positive about the industry that that you would like to see get more focus that maybe isn't getting the focus in the media you know like the media seems to be yeah. picking up all the negative stuff you know what is it about the industry that actually excites you that you know that makes you proud to be sort of a a member of the club so to speak oh there are tons of things that i think are positive in the industry the first thing i'd say actually is if if we are going to be credited as an industry with teaching people how to enter high schools and shoot with guns because of first person shooters <laughs> i want credit for teaching kids how to drive from our driving games. Fighter pilots had to fly. People had to fight. I yeah. mean, the idea, or better football players. The NFL should have improved <laughs> a hundredfold because these guys would have learned on Madden, right? Right, right. But, you know, whatever. I, I think there's a lot of things to be proud about in the game industry. We give a lot of people a lot of enjoyment, a lot of entertainment. Um, I, you know, any game show you go to, there are people of all walks of life, all types Absolutely. of people. It's very inclusive. Um, the game industry, I think, overall is an extremely positive industry. Uh, and yes, of any industry is going to have a little bit of dark side somewhere. But I think overall, the Every game industry one. has shown itself to be, uh, you know, very pure. And we we're, we're the whipping boy of the moment. You know, it was it was Elvis Presley when I was growing up. I love heavy metal, still do. That's had its moment, right? Everything had its moment. I totally agree with you. But and, what's and next? Games. That's the problem. That's what always scares me. Well, actually, me. I'll like, tell you what, what is it is. You, you can always people. tell what's next because I'm networking? working in social networking, yeah, right? Okay, okay. So I've been working with social networking. Yeah, you're, and, you're you know, they're getting right. a huge amount of a very unfair right. uh, negative publicity. And actually, I think more than the game industry has. Uh, and I think, unfortunately for them, maybe fortunately for the game industry, the world's kind of headed there uh, right now. All right, we got another caller. We do. Caller. So we. Yo, what's up? You got a question? What's up, dogs? What's uh, up? <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I'm really a big fan of like Crash and stuff, and Crash Bandicoot. Thanks, man. And like, actually, this was my first game for my console. Oh, I've, I've oh he's got well, it right that's there. there. Yes, one right here. It, wow. I can see you bought it at discount though, because that was the greatest <laughs> oh. hits packaging. Oh. Like, you got it for 1995. Oh, yeah. So he played it I, so well, much, you, he had to buy a new copy. I, though. I have did, you, did you buy like, your system? On this. You probably bought your system in '97 or Christmas. 96 is that correct actually no i, I bought a ps1 yeah and like uh, i'm not sure when it was but i don't All know right, a well, long time ago. Okay. <laughs> you got yeah. a question buddy yeah um actually no <laughs> just, like, show how, the game. how great how great do you think the success of this game was uh, which which game are we looking at? Crash, I guess. Or, or you know what? Someone in Stickum actually asked, "Why was the game so popular in Japan? Like, why Japan of all?" Yeah, you know, places? that that has got to be the hardest question I, to answer. And I, I can I can I can tell you a lot of eyebrows. reasons. Well, you know, interestingly, when we first showed Crash, uh, Crash to Sony Japan, they looked at the character and they said, "This will never work. Never, <laughs> this character will never work." And I I said, "Well, what's wrong with it?" And they couldn't really explain what it was. So I was kind of getting a vibe. So I went out to. Charlotte, who was one of our artists, and I said, okay, I want you to do a really quick mock-up, close his mouth, he had this huge grin in the picture, make his eyes a little black Pac-Man, take away the color and the, the boom, and kind of tone him down a little. And she did it, and we brought it in, and they said, that'll work. So there was a slightly different crash Amazing. in Japan than there was in the United States. We did a lot of work on the game uh, to, to, to actually work for the Japanese market. Aku Aku, which was the uh, witch doctor, right. kind of, he would come out and give you hints because right. they thought the Japanese market... For whatever reason, our Japanese producers thought they needed more hints, maybe because w- we were explaining things in a Western way, and maybe they needed right. a little bit, a little bit of extra coaching. Um, I remember specifically there was a death where Crash got smashed, and he was walking around, his head kind of got right. crushed in his I shoes. Right, I remember that one. That was Literally. not allowed in the Japanese version because <laughs> at that time there had been a, a horrible uh, spree of killings, <laughs> what? and they were leaving kids at the front of schoolyards with their shoes and their heads on it. No joke. And so oh, we really, wow. we really oh tailored the game to what the Japanese market would and wouldn't like, and we had the best marketing team, I will say, I have ever had in the really game cool. industry in Japan, and they took the character, 
which again, it's a Western character created by a guy that grew up in the United States, it's in guys that grew up in the United States, not a Japanese character. And they did a, a campaign of making that character friendly for Japan that was absolutely incredible. Wow. The ads were incredible. The stuff they did, I still watch it and I enjoy it. it was was really anything good. Uh, was anything uh, done with Jack and Daxter? Because I know recently in Ratchet and Clank, they just did a makeover for the new one for the PS3 too. Right. They're very like subtle differences. Like I was joking about the eyebrows but they turned his eyebrows black and gave him green shorts instead of like orange shorts. Well, here, here's my personal opinion on Jack and Daxter is that we, and by we I mainly mean I, made a mistake in, <laughs> in, in directing that title uh, to be too broad for too many artists, uh, audiences. Crash was designed as we thought Crash should be and then tweaked for other territories. Gotcha. Jack was a mishmash of a lot of ideas from a lot of people as we were creating the character. And at the end of the day, I don't think he looked like a great Western character. I don't think he was a great Japanese character. There were things we did for the European market that I don't think were great. There were things we did actually for, this, for Saudi Arabia and other markets like that that might have hurt it. I think that character was, was, a, it was, it was a little too much uh, of the kitchen sink. Um, right. Whereas, so, whereas I think Crash was a little more pure a vision, okay. and I wouldn't make that mistake again. Gotcha. And that was that was my fault. That was actually my suggestion. So, what exactly are your favorite kind of games? Are they platformers? Are they you know? Is that why you made platform style games? Are those were those yeah, you always know, your kind of games? Well, first of all, it's changed over time. Before Doom, first person shooters, not a big favorite of mine. After Doom, always been a big favorite of mine. Um, it, it's really hard for me to pick a favorite genre. It really goes game by game. I mean, that, that, that's the best answer I can give. I get addicted to the most ridiculous things in the, in the, don't like that genre, play one game, it's a great game, and I get addicted yeah. to it. So I don't really have a favorite genre. I was never a big driving fan, but I don't remember which Need for Speed it was, but it was, it was one of the, the more recent ones on the, uh, not that recent, but a PS2 one, just took me, and I played the whole thing nice. start to end, nice. right? And, I, I just don't know what it is. It's All right. just some I've, things do that. I've actually got a great follow-up question for that, but uh, let's take a caller first. Caller, uh, thank you for being patient. You got a question for Jason? Uh, yeah. Uh, what game do you think... Wait, I'm, that's not my question. Never mind. <laughs> uh, so that was for another show he's calling answer into. answer is six. <laughs> yeah. Do you believe that games will take over the world... <laughs> as, as like a menacing monster, or what the hell? as like a mind control device. I, I don't actually, and, sure. and I, I can answer that. I don't think games take over this world. The world. That's why I, say, I didn't want to say that is the game industry going to be the strongest entertainment medium. Sometimes I like to go home and turn on a movie or turn on the TV and veg out and Blue just Ray watch. Specifically, right? Yeah, I Blu-ray player. I just got Rat Tattoo. <laughs> I watch Rat Tattoo <laughs> like Blu -ray thousand times. I'm in awe show. of the CG on that thing. Uh, right? It's awesome. And. Uh, you know, sometimes I don't want to be interacting. So, will the game industry wipe out television? And no, of course not. Uh, you know, and it'll it'll have new challenges. The game industry is challenged by the social networking. Right, People are spending right. a huge amount of time on Facebook. Facebook, in essence, is a social game. It's a huge social game. That's Same with MySpace. And you get addicted to it. You statement. have to check. You have to where are I? where where am I right now? I have to update my Facebook. Uh, you know, profile and say what I'm doing, and I do it now for my BlackBerry, so I do it live on the road. It's taking some of my time. That's time that I don't play with games. So will games rule the world? No. However, on the flip side, games are never going to uh, die again like they did in the Nintendo period, and they will be relevant and a big part of the entertainment uh, industry for the rest of time. There's no question that we've we've installed ourselves, and we're we're going to get bigger certainly awesome. uh, before we before we stop. Uh, interesting question, but a fantastic answer. Thank you very much. What's your uh, follow-up question? My, my follow-up question is this, and uh, it's a question that I've been uh, really enjoying asking on the show uh, for various guests. But, you know, there's certain titles, like, in my life that have been sort of inspirational or I will remember back to the times playing that as some of my best video game experiences ever. Right. And, you know, I, I think that it tells a lot about a person and about the types of games and, you know, what are your sort of inspirational, like, these games on my deathbed, I will, like, be remembering, you know, right. playing these games? Oh, or there's, there have been so many. I mean, what I, are, like, I think if I had to pick one, I've, I've been head. asked before if I yeah. had to pick one, so it's not an easy decision. I know. So. But, but I have picked one. Okay. And that was uh, the day that I first played Doom. I played for 18 and a half hours straight without eating or, or doing anything else. Which, and we're talking about like the original. Oh, the original. You downloaded, yeah, from, downloaded the from the BBS. Yeah, okay. absolutely. We were at MIT. 
I wasn't in classes because I'm not that smart, but my business mm -hmm. partner was getting a master's degree in artificial intelligence. And he said, check this out. And, and Andy showed it to me. I sat down 18 hours later. A caco demon came around the corner and I fell backwards in my chair. I was actually scared. My heart was pounding and I realized that at that moment, games had gone from, you know, playing something to a true entertainment form that could touch me and awesome. reach out and kind of make a difference in my life. And I think that that moment was kind of when I decided, okay, games is going the distance. Um, so that, that I think is the moment. But, you know, there have been so many. At GoldenEye, um, was it was another huge one ultima back in the days playing the ultima games huge 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 yeah, um, ultima online is one of my big ones that's definitely a life-changing game for me uh, mario the first donkey kong country i, I loved I, I played that multiple times you know through yeah uh it was a great huge game for me um there 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 have been so many you know there really, really have so many there really haven't but you know uh that's that's and then if you go back even farther, I remember playing uh, Breakout on, on the Channel F, which was actually before the Atari system, again, dating myself. And, uh, you know, I'd play that for 10 hours straight. And, and, and you went was, through was all those consoles, ball. too, right? You got you Oh, yeah. Atari. Oh, no, no, no. I had, I had some of the winners and some of the losers, you know? I, <laughs> some of them people will never remember even existed. And, and, and speaking of, you know, some of the losers. Atari uh, what, Lynx, for example. What Does was anyone it? remember yeah. the Atari oh, Lynx? I had yeah. one, I Batman on it, great, you know? Uh, and and you know actually going along yeah one of the guys line. who made Clax works at Naughty Dog really so, yeah well, then and speaking of ahead. Naughty Dog you know one of our questions that we wanted to ask you was right. you know looking at Uncharted and all the success and it's being called the greatest looking game so far in any console all the critics love it fans are loving it. even people that hated the PS3 are you know turning their minds around on it you know what do you think and how do you how do you feel as a co-founder of the company original co-founder how do you feel when you see them putting out work like that well i'm not surprised at all i mean i i've always said that that naughty dog was and probably still is one of the best teams out there and that the talent that we managed to to get to work at naughty dog partially due to the fact that we were successful and people wanted to work there but i also like to think that we were very selective at picking the right people to work at Naughty Dog, ended up creating a team that's absolutely a world powerhouse. So I'm not in any way surprised that Naughty Dog is still putting out top-notch games with or without me. And I, I again, more power to them, but I, no surprise. It's not, like, it's not like I saw Uncharted come out and saw the reviews and said, how did they do it without me? I told, I told, this, is my, Holy shit. this is my expectation. <laughs> Of Naughty Dog right, is that right. they're going to succeed, that's, and that's good. Now, I mean, but actually, there are not a whole lot of companies out there that can say that they've got such a legacy. If we've had this team for you know X amount of years, and these people have been, so it's another great accomplishment in itself. No, absolutely, and if I, I don't know what Uncharted is going to sell because obviously it just came out, well, but I would imagine lifetime that it will be yet another multi-million selling title, and almost no developer can say for this number of years, and it's been years. Yeah, every title yeah. we've made has sold more than a million units, and that's entertained more than a million people, and obviously wow. there's something right about that. There, there's definitely something right about you know, that. When I left, we had already passed 35 million, so, wow. and that was seven titles. So you know, I, I'm sure with Jack X, which again, I didn't work on, um, and, and Uncharted Lifetime, and un, probably Uncharted 2, I would guess, and they'll, they, you know, they'll keep yeah. kicking, kicking ass. That's awesome. just what they do. All right, let's take another caller, guys. Uh, thank for, you for all your good calls. Uh, haven't had any of the... You know, crap. Jobber, thanks for waiting. So. Thanks, Jobber. What's up? Yeah, what's up, Jobbers? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? Speaking of Jobbers, Fire Pro Wrestling, like the latest PS2, uh, I, I one up gave it a ten. It's, a, it's amazingly <laughs> terrible looking, but that that game has such a legacy that you know. Anyway, caller, your question. <laughs> I first want to say, Jason, I think you're a legend in the industry, and I Thank love you. Crash. It's like my first big game. Thank you. And I have to ask you a question because I always want to know, even with like the new technologies today, that games are so much better, there's still limits. If you had no limits, what kind of game would you make? Well, if I had no limits, I'd make an infinite game, right? I mean, it, would, <laughs> it, would, it would never end. It would have an infinite number of different possibilities. You would plug in it, right here. It then. would automatically detect the game you wanted to play and make that game for you. I mean, if I had... That's the fucking holodeck. The, the thing about technology, and, and we were talking about this earlier, the thing about technology is that it will always get better and there will always be more limits, but there will always be a limit, and thank God there's a limit because that gives us something to do the next time, right? I, I was just saying yeah. earlier, the first time I saw a 256 color image yeah. on an Apple IIGS, 
uh, and it was it was like you know internet palette. It wasn't any two hundred fifty six. It was I looked at it and I said graphics will never get any better. <laughs> this is it. This is the best thing. Eleven out of ten, right and there. Boom. <laughs> I, I, you know what I think will happen, and, and I gave a speech a few years ago uh, at a developer symposium about this, is that graphics and processor power will become less of a challenge, and the challenge will be creating new and interesting gameplay, which yeah. I think is very healthy for the industry. I can tell you with Crash Bandicoot, most of our effort was getting enough polygons on the screen to just get that game to work. So to get it to play well didn't get the same amount of attention mm. that you can give to a game now when you can say, oh, you know, it's, it's okay, we're going to get everything in there, the cars are going to look like cars. You know, a few thousand less polygons, uh, we wouldn't have had a crash. It just wouldn't have looked right. Wow. You know? And now you've got enough to throw at it. So you have to decide how you're going to make the game, and I think that's very healthy. I, I don't know what game I'd make if I had infinite time. It's in a, well, that's but are there certain el- I think, you know, but are there certain elements in a game you know, specific that you always try would try to get in or would want to get in. You know, you know how there's differences in first-person shooters between Call of Duty Four and Warhawk. Even their lock-on system. Are there certain aspects that maybe if you had enough time and resources that you could get in that you'd always wanted to get in? Well, you get things. I mean, if you're trying to do something natural, they get more and more natural. The physics acts more like real physics, and right. you can rely more on simulation and less on brute force. When someone fell down in Crash, someone animated that guy falling down. And if he fell down on a rock, he could float halfway off the rock and halfway over a gap because it just didn't handle that. And it was a lot of work to get that animation done. And if you had three different places you could die, it was three times the work. Now you let someone die, you just throw them on the floor with Ragdoll, and it just kind of works. So things tend to look better. They tend to get better. But there's always going to be... Look, we are a simulation in essence, right? Right. Like the of physics of the planet is simulation. And the number of lights simulated in a room and reflections and refractions and all of the other things, the guys that are way ahead of us in the sense, for example, Pixar and Ratatouille, in the sense that they let their frames render for an hour... We let our frames render for a 60th of a second, a 30th of a right. second in a game console, are still challenged when trying to make things look like they look in the real world. So we have many, many years to go before we get to a point where you'll really trick the human eye. Uh, and at that point, we'll have higher resolution televisions and we'll just need more processing power to get things to work. Then we'll go some sort of 3D immersive something somehow. And that'll be even more power required. So there will always be a challenge that, that technology well, you know, will limit. Well, I guess, you know, even getting more specific, are there any things you don't like? For instance, we hate stealth games. Are there any sort of elements in games that you like? I just I can't stand this. Like for me, it's the flood in Halo. I can't stand those little things that pop up, and it's in Umbrella Chronicles as well. Like I can't stand when games do that little stuff, or some people can't stand, you know, when they have to do a dungeon level or something. Are there little things in games that? Well, you that's bad game try? design. That has nothing to do with technology. Mm-hmm. I mean, and again, it's your opinion personally. A lot yeah, of yeah. Well, I I kind of like stealth, and a lot of people I think like stealth and. And I could give you a statistical reason why stealth is going to become more prevalent in the future. But, it, you know, there, every game, you have to take it and look at it and decide whether you like it and what someone's put in it uh, you like. I don't think technology, more technology, is going to force anyone to put anything in a game you don't like, I, I think, to answer the question. Right, we, we Not that they the won't do it, line, but they won't right. be forced. Uh, very, sorry, very patient caller. caller. Very patient caller. Yeah. As we're I talk a lot. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's a good thing. What's up, caller? I like hearing your voice. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Whoa. Ooh, hey. Hey. <laughs> What's your name? Yeah, he's a god to me, bros. I can't stop it. I mean, I love Crash and Jax. So. Cool. Thank you. Question. What is it? <laughs> oh, uh, shit. I forgot. This. Uh, second question, I just want to ask, uh, there's something that I always, like, wanted to ask you when it came to your art direction in Jax. Why such a giant change from Jax 1 to 2? That was an attempt uh, on our part to, uh, to find the market. Um, I think that, that, again, the design we did on Jack 1 kind of fell in this weird mishmash that kind of seemed odd to people in America, it seemed odd to people in Japan. It, it didn't really satisfy anybody. And we looked at the market at that time. And there's no question that Grand Theft Auto, which was completely unpredictable as a phenomenon when we started Jack, uh, had become a massive phenomenon. Uh, and we just said to ourselves, okay, if we could redesign Jack and Daxter for what we want and completely ignore what anybody else might like, what would it look like? And 
Jack became a little bit harder core. That's, he just became a little more adult, a little more edgy. Uh, additionally, another bad decision I make, I'm bringing them all up, I didn't want Jack to speak because I had played Gex and didn't like Gex. Sorry, guys. Mm. A lot of the Gex <laughs> guys worked on the Naughty Dog team, so I can say this. Um, I didn't want a character that you played that spoke and made a joke that you didn't like because that distances you from the character. When the, when the character Fair you're enough. playing says something you're not into, you're like, that's not me, that's a character I have to play. So I wanted Jack to be silent so that you could be Jack. Right. Daxter can be a pain in the neck. You right. can say anything. You can be like, this, is a, huh. this guy's a fucking idiot, but he's my sidekick. Right. It's not me. I'm Jack. So that was a mistake, and Jack came off, I think, very weak because of it. And with Jack, too, we wanted to give him a voice, but we weren't. I wasn't willing to jump into the full voice. So Jack is kind of, you know, he says, he says plain vanilla stuff that won't offend you, but he has a personality, kind of. So he says, yeah, we're going to go do that. Oh, really? And things like, you know, <laughs> he has no personality, but at the same time he speaks. And we just were trying as hard as we could to kind of straddle the line that eventually we just, as, a, as an industry, I think, we finally got it right, and characters now have full dialogue, and you don't right. hate them. We became better writers. We became better uh-huh. at, at allowing the characters to do that. Um, but that's a long answer for why we, we changed the look between Jack 1 and Jack 2. All right. That was a, that was a great question. Did you like it or not like it, actually, if the color's still on the line? He is not. He's oh, not. sorry. Oh. Sadness. Uh, well, I'm sure he'll. I'm sure he'll message. We have Suma. many callers, though. Suma, so. let let him know. Uh, hopefully, you know what his answer was. Uh, caller, welcome to the program. You got a question for Jason? Yes, I do. Um, whenever you had Crash or Jack down on a piece of paper, or like he was like a brainchild of yours, was there ever a moment when you went, "Oh my God, this is it. This is going to be spectacular." Oh, there's lots of moments when you say that. And unfortunately, they're only outweighed by the times that you play the game and you, you notice every flaw because you're the developer that no one else is going to notice. And you say, that, the grass is just wrong and this is going to fail. And it's, Making games is an extremely emotional experience. So for every high, there's a low. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I mean, imagine this. You put it on the shelf and you just wait for the average of the world to give you an opinion, right? Some people are going to love it. You know that. No matter how bad it is, someone's going to love it. Someone's going to hate it no matter how good it is. So you wait to get the average of what the world thinks, and that's going to determine whether or not you entertained or you didn't entertain the people that you wanted to entertain. And that moment is you think, I got it. This is the character. It's going to work well. But at the same time, you are so nervous because you can see the flaws. It's too late to fix. Mm -hmm. No game's perfect. No game will ever be perfect. So um, can you talk and, about and some of the very frightening. Can you talk about some of the issues that maybe gamers don't necessarily know about or ever see that affect making a game that you know personal barriers that design developers have to overcome because a lot of the time I feel maybe developers get the blame unnecessarily on a lot of things when really it's they're getting a lot of pressure from publishers they have to get a game out in a certain time are there a lot of things like that that the gamers don't necessarily see or know about that you would like them to know about oh well every, every situation is different at the end of the day the developer is responsible for the title they make and you can complain that the marketing wasn't as good as it could not It could have been, but a good title should rise to the top on its own. So I take full responsibility as a developer for anything I ever developed. If I'm under pressure, it's my obligation to fight like a, a rat bastard to make that pressure go away and, and to make it clear that as a developer, I'm going to make the title that I believe needs to come out. Amen. There's certainly bad situations. There have been horrible situations when developers have tried to do that, and they have been told you have to bump up the deadline by six months or your budget's been cut by 20%. Uh, there are terrible stories out there. On the other side, there are inspirational stories of publishers saying, we believe in this, we're going to give you more to do better, uh, and we're going to market it with a bigger budget, and we're, we're going to help you in any way we can. How can we do that? Uh, there, there are huge numbers of pressures. Things, you know, the worst case scenario, I, I will say that, the worst case scenario is that you run into a wall of gameplay that can't be fixed. And that does happen, where you've designed the game around a theory about what people are going to like when they're playing it. And you get to a specific point, you've spent a lot of effort on the game, and you realize this isn't going to work. And that happens with the first of every game that we did. Crash 1, wow. there were things we did, and we got halfway through, and we just we, we realized it wasn't going to work. And sometimes the simplest things fix it. I'll give you an example from Crash 1. The boxes, the crates that made Crash, named Crash, that are Crash, 
We're not put in until alpha. Alpha is a point of the game where you're theoretically you're done, done with the but content. there are a lot of boxes. Yeah. Right. They went in in a February. The game came out that holiday season in September. Wow. It had been in development for over a year and a half before they went in. So we looked at the game, and, and, I, and I just said, we can't put more than a certain number of enemies on the screen because the PlayStation 1 can't handle it. We can't, therefore, make the game that much denser. There's too much distance between things. People need something to do. Let's build these crates. <laughs> and we put these crates in. Andy the, and the artist awesome. that did, put the crates in. And I remember the producer came in. His name is Mark Cerny. And he's one of the most brilliant people in the audience. And we were under incredible pressure. And he looked at it and he said, what are you wasting your time with the boxes? we got all this other stuff to solve. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was that little change wow. that made Crash what it is. And awesome. today, still, Ratchet uses crates and that's all based off that kind of wow. realization that we needed, you know, yeah. uh, this puzzle element that went in between the creatures. Now, Ratchet these days has no polygon problem to overcome, but the gameplay worked. So, I think without the crates, Crash would have failed. All right, we got uh, we got our last callers because we need to wrap up here in just a moment. So, a caller, feel lucky that you're able to get in at the last moment. Uh, you have a question for Jason? Yeah, have you ever said in war at the Lab Factory? Have I ever done laugh what now? Factory? <laughs> All right. Wow. I think she said, have I ever performed at the at Laugh, the laugh factory? factory? And the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> that, that was probably uh, one that was of the, the lamest that was my evil. That, that was my was, evil twin. That was an awful prank call. <laughs> <laughs> I would have rather had the, is your refrigerator running call? Do we have one more <laughs> caller? Is that it? Can We've we got one, one more. more? Well, Certainly. I did have a question from uh, two times oh, yes. okay. via uh, Skype. Two um, times? Yeah, he wanted to know... What your response was um, when you were invited to to come onto the show, like EG, like ha, you know, <laughs> did you know ha, did you know of the show before you came here? And also, you know, how does being here compare to like you know doing an interview with uh, you know somewhere else? Right. I don't know. I guess uh, the, the fans often do like wonder, like you know, how is it different being on this show versus like somewhere else? Well, every show is different. I mean, I've done live live shows in uh, Germany, uh, Japan. Uh, I did a Good Morning Ireland, which is kind of like Good Morning America, but in Ireland. <laughs> um, <laughs> Top of the morning. <laughs> I've, done, I've done shows all over the world. They're all different. Um, one thing I will say, and I, I fundamentally believe this, is that the connection with the gamer is extremely important to the developer, and that developers tend to lock themselves in a room and make games, and that it's very important that they, at the end of the day, speak to people and that they, you know, there's a there's a conversation there, and obviously right. you can't knock on everybody's door, but something like this gives an opportunity for if you, if even only a few callers to call oh, yeah. for people to ask questions and to kind of demystify games, and I think it'll increase the appreciation people have for what goes into them. Exactly, you know, yeah. if you're talking about it, and people do have questions that they can't get answered. So the more of these shows with the more developers, uh, the better. And I think you know I, I encourage every other developer who watches. To do Developers it. are hey, more than welcome you. to knock on our door and come in. We yeah. we welcome Open and and we actually you know I wholeheartedly agree with you, Jason. I feel like I I want to get more developers on here because I want them to have that connection. I want them you know a gamer ask question. Why did you put a crate in the upper tier <laughs> of this level? You know like I would love who gets to, right, to do well, that. It, I would it, love to have the developer the come point in. Point is that it's not a science. It is an art. Mm -hmm. So nothing that we do when we create games is going to work and. You know, today is the fifteenth day of making the game. This is what I have to work on today. It's all very live and very, very collaborative, and it is an art. So it's it's very interesting, I think, to hear, and I love hearing other developers' stories. Also, you have artists that you could bring in here. You have uh, programmers you could bring in here um, to ask them about specific parts of making the game, because I don't think people realize, you know, how detailed each little department of mm -hmm. making right. the game is, and how talented those people are at doing what they do. Awesome. Well, we agree. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. that little icon right there that's flashing tape. Yeah, it's been flashing. Oh, you, is that <laughs> we got about two minutes left on that tape. You your show by the tape we, when we the tape We have a three-hour tape, so we can do three shows. <laughs> I have, they do that because I am just like I you. Just, I like to talk. I bought an HD camera that will accept. Uh, it's a 60-gigabyte hard drive. 
so it will do hours See, of ho- show. <laughs> you guys can go hours. See, this is their excuse to, to that, quash. That's me. like a summa statement. <laughs> <It> is, <laughs> awesome. Jason, it has been my pleasure. Nice. and I'm My sure pleasure, fans, and thanks um, to everybody absolutely for love. Yeah, all by. the great questions. Thanks um, to you. Yeah, I want to uh, I want to thank Suma for uh, moderating over there and keeping those yahoos in check. Thank you, brother. They were good today. They're good. They good. only had to do one good. band. Uh, camera, yeah. of course, and uh, Jason, only one prank call. Uh, who, by the way, you know, I'm not sure it was a prank. We may have misheard yeah, it. Yeah, we may yeah. have. Who knows? And we look forward to uh, you know not only any project that uh, that, that you start uh, working yeah, on. Well, but I, I promise the world that I, I promise everyone I will be back in games. At some All right. Point. Well, yeah. we'll, the uh, magnet is is pulling me back. Yeah. we'll get you back on the show then when uh, when you're Pan ready rested and ready. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, guys. We will see you next week because it's Turkey Day here in the U.S. So join us next Monday for week 141 of Epileptic Gaming. I'm the world's loudest human, DJ Wheat, and we will see you Monday. Have a great Thanksgiving, guys. Peace. Thank you.